Welcome everybody. This is uh, Internet Marketing Unleashed. I'm Scott Patton, the Dean of Blogonomics and Podology. I'm so happy to have you here and I am very, very delighted to introduce an absolutely amazing entrepreneur. And I think the way to start introducing him is to kind of begin a little bit past the beginning. So yes, he was born and then in uh, five years after he was born, he started his first business. And uh, then, you know, we did a, a bunch of things with, you know, the things that you do as you're growing up. And then as he became an adult and he had two children, they were hit by lightning in his boat. So we're going to find out a little bit more about that story because I don't know uh, too many of the details there. But I know that that, as a father, would be an incredibly traumatic experience. Uh, I Thank God I've never gone through that, but I really want to ask him about it. And then about 2009, sorry, before 2009, in about a seven-year period, he made a ton of money and sadly, the following year, filed for $2.2 million bankruptcy. So uh, it's not been a straight uphill <laughs> climb. We, like everybody else, things go up, things go down. Uh, fortunately, a couple of years after that, one of the most amazing things that can happen in someone's life uh, happened, which he got married to his, his sweetheart, which was awesome. And that was on 11-11-2011. Uh, so yeah, way to go. Uh, and now in 2015, just a few short years ago, he published seven number one best-selling books. And we'll find out which one is his favorite. And today he is living life without limits. And as I was reading this before, I was uh, it just sort of struck me because one of my uh, very, very good friends started a podcast, which she calls Life Without Limits. So I know that... Uh, he and I and, and she, if they ever meet, are kind of on the, the same wavelengths. Pretty cool. So, Trevor Crane, thank you very much for coming to the show. And how are you doing today? I'm doing really good. And thank you for that intro. There are a couple things there in the bio that I, I'll, I'll correct as we move along. But it's okay. You got very close to the to the details there. Maybe my team and I sent you something a little bit inaccurate. I'll just clean those up at some stage during our conversation. Okay. <laughs> well, the first question that we want to know is what was your first business? Okay, so that was like a, definitely a weird intro that was really kind of fun, though. You said I was born and I started a business when I was five. Is, if, they, if people understood properly, that's what it sounded like. And so, yes, I have talked about that before because um, I, one of my first memories is of my dad leaving – uh, the house for let's say a week or two and he and he pulled me aside when I was very little and said Trevor It's up to you to take care of the household now, you know for this week or two while he was gone And I took it very seriously and my father was a horseshoer and he had his own business And to me my mom and dad had obviously hung the moon because who isn't they're smarter than the president of the United States When you're five years old, they're like everything they're God and president and queen all wrapped up into one. And so when he said it was my responsibility, apparently I took it seriously. And so I started my first business when I was five and uh, I created something that first day in entrepreneurship that a lot of people struggle with in, in, in business. And it's that I created a profit. Now my business wasn't that sexy. I apparently I liked rocks when I was a little kid. So I took rocks that I found in my yard and went all the way over to the next door neighbor's yard a long way. And I sold, I tried selling them some of the rocks from my yard. And when I, when I say that I, I made a profit, I like if, assuming that I made a dollar that day, I think I did, <laughs> you know, that I made a, I, I made profit that day. Like I took something. And a lot of times I find that entrepreneurs don't do that in life. They build their website. They work on their logo. Maybe they've got a business card, but the fear comes in. And apparently when I was five, my dad put the fear of God in me that I had to take care of the family and. Apparently rocks was where it was at. I just wish I'd have put googly eyes on them and invented the pet rock because that was, this is the 1970s, man. I could have, I could have, I was so close. It could have been huge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so that, that was the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey. No, pretty much. I, I can't remember what happened before then, but yeah. 
Uh, and then I grew up with a bit of that entrepreneurial spirit. I don't remember that we had a lot of money growing up. But from my recollection, we did couldn't afford stuff. My parents would argue about money and whatnot. So I typically uh, found something uh, that I could try to earn a buck from, whether it was selling candy at school or I did a lot of sneaky little things probably when I was a little kid. But yeah, I, I was entrepreneurial kind of from the beginning. Uh, and I think that came from my mom and dad kind of telling me that if you wanted to get ahead, that's what you needed to do. Cool. Cool. Good for you. Like I, I spent 20 years from about when I was 17 to almost 40, uh, working for a large company as an employee, as a cog in the, in the mechanism, so to speak. And, uh, my entrepreneurialism came out in the, uh, in the organization and most of the time was not appreciated. I actually would say 99.9% .9 was not appreciated. And as you were talking, it, it reminded me of um, one store that I went to manage. Like I was running these grocery stores and everything we did, $10,000 in sales would disappear. Like we put a new deli in, sales went down 10 grand. We took the... Uh, bleach and we took it out of the floor flower section and put it somewhere so it wouldn't make the flower all smell bleachy and we lost ten thousand dollars and I was sitting with a at a chamber of commerce meeting beside someone who was uh, going out and planting trees a tree planter well he wasn't the, really the tree planter he fed the tree planters and he was having a problem with his uh, supplier so being a grocery store we had access to supplies and we had access to the massive sizes that he needed and so i started selling him product but unfortunately where we were at maybe a 30 percent gross market uh, markup he was he was needing 10 percent in order to make it all work so the profit was really low but i went ahead and did it anyway because it kept the sales level up and he was actually a significant amount of the sales uh, and one of my employees said you know we're not making any money doing this like why why are you doing it and I looked at him and I said, it justifies another full-time employee. In other words, I don't have to lay somebody off. And he looked at me like, oh, my God, like you care about us? It was just, and it was very foreign in the grocery business for anyone to really care about their employees. But I certainly did. I'm looking at it and thinking, you know, how can we make life better for these people? Um, so I don't know why that all came up, but you <laughs> <laughs> you you've grown you've grown some businesses and uh, you had some success and then you had uh, some challenges. So tell us a little bit about what happened in that two thousand and one two thousand eight uh, period, and then what lessons you got from. Because uh, I am hoping that you will not repeat uh, whatever happened. Well, lessons will be repeated until or mistakes will be repeated until lessons are learned and. Uh, one of the, the cool things about your story when you were working for someone else and you were doing the entrepreneurial things and you said that certain decisions were being made and then they lost money. And whether that was your decision or the company decision, the only difference I see in, in business and entrepreneurship is when you make those decisions or someone on your team makes the decisions, you lose the money. <laughs> you know, the nice thing about it being somebody else's company is they lost the $10,000. All I was thinking is, Hold on, that was $10,000 I lost because every mistake you pay for, it. whether you do it or your employee does it or whatever, and you're justifying those things based on, hey, I'm losing money, but it's going to keep an employee in. That is a choice, um, not necessarily a, a, a long win choice. So let me, let's go ahead and back to the question. So when I started making some good money, I've, I've, I've actually had the good fortune of making millions of dollars in three different industries. One was uh, tourism and water sports, and I started my first business uh, that was uh, a water sports parasail business. And in the first week I had that business is when I had two kids hit by lightning. Now, this is part of me actually correcting part of the intro bio there. These were not my kids, but they were on my watch. So it was uh, okay. an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old on July 4th weekend, we're up in the parachute and they got hit by lightning and I was driving the boat and I had to breathe life back into them. And we had an incredible amount of drama, as you might be able to imagine around this time. That's a fun story and it's a, I can, we could spend more time on it, but I want to get to the lessons around it. So let's just say that they were not breathing. 
uh, having been electrocuted, and we picked them up out of the water, breathed life back into them, and then after all was said and done with Coast Guard investigations and lawsuits and a variety of things, the parents gave us a hug and said, thank you for saving the life of our kids. Uh, so that was good. However, uh, my partner lost his his uh, boat license when that happened. We had uh, a significant amount of negative press. Um, he wanted to quit the business. I ended up ha buying the business from him, whatever was left over, and and running it all myself because I did not want to quit, and he did. And then at once, and business did not get better immediately. It got worse before it got better. So uh, I remember when I first learned to make money. Finally, like I, we made some money in that business, but when you take a boat and an engine, actually you take an engine and wrap it in fiberglass and dip it in salt water, you have a problem when that's your business. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in that business, not just to mention uh, electricity. <laughs> so I ended up, the it got real bad when I had to get a job to support my business habit like I was a heroin addict. <laughs> you know, like I would, uh, I'd go wait tables all night. I would shower on the beach and run across the uh, the, the beach to, and run across the street to a hotel um, restaurant where I could wait tables all night just to make $100 so that I could have enough money to pay rent. And I did that for about six months until I thought I was going to die because I could only get by on three, four hours sleep a night for a certain period of time. And even though I was in my twenties, I was like, I still needed some sleep sometime. <laughs> and it wasn't until I finally was like, I just looked at it and I was like, dude, how can I make an extra hundred bucks a day? Cause if I could just do that in the, in the nine to five that I'm out on the beach all day in this parasail business. And I was the only one holding the keys to the kingdom at that stage. It was all me. I finally learned how to sell, and that was learning how to sell a T-shirt of all things saved my bacon. There's a whole story around that we could get into if anybody needs to learn that process. I now teach that, but that was the beginning. I ended up uh, finally making enough money that I could quit my job. Uh, that was a year, year and a half, Scott. I almost burned that business to the ground until I understood the psychology of sales and adding more value and letting it be okay to charge more money for things. It was, a, it was an incredible journey. <clears throat> and I made my first seven figures in that business. Um, I got out of that for a variety of reasons. Ended up burning that to the ground eventually, Scott. <laughs> Not literally, but like, yeah, but lost everything with that. Um, my next business was a uh, uh, an environmental protection company. So the company that made me the most money was one where we did street cleaning of all things. I lived in West Palm Beach. Well, I... I transitioned out of the water sports business where I made about $50 per person into a business where I had tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars per client, which established this new uh, idea in me that it, it was just as much work to get a high paying client as it was to get these low paying clients. And I had a lot of fewer clients could take better care of them, create more value for them. And I made a lot of money in that business. And I was very proud of myself, patting myself on the back about how awesome I was. And you know what broke the um, the mold there for me, Scott? It's the same thing that happened in my parasol business. I found someone to help me, but in my uh, my 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 street cleaning and environmental protection business, I finally broke free when I hired my first professional mentor. Not just finding somebody who was good at something. That's, that was my typical mentorship thing. Like they were good at it. I'd hire them. They'd come work for me for a while. Teach me how to sell a t-shirt. Teach me how to grow my water sports business. That was cool. But when I hired my first consultant or mentor, he took me from uh, like it was about 10 grand a month, 10 or 20 grand a month to 80 grand a month in four months. So it was, it was gigantic. And so- That's amazing. Yeah. It was really like I learned that it was important to- invest in somebody to show me how to do stuff. And half the stuff I thought I already knew. I'm a guy. Come on. I don't ask. I don't stop and ask for directions. I know where I'm going. I can figure it out. But I finally just had to swallow my pride and uh, ask for some help and, and be open to receiving it. There's a big difference between asking and not being open, which I've done, <laughs> unfortunately, made that stupid mistake. Think I'm too smart. Don't shut up and just listen and take the advice and, and do something. But my first mentor helped me significantly there, and I was killing it and thought I was God's gift because I had I, I could leave town for six weeks and go to Fiji and 
spend time with Tony Robbins on his private island. And I'm thinking I'm so cool because he and his wife drove us around in their golf cart for a day or whatever, right before. And then, and I come home and my business had gotten bigger and I pat myself on the back about how smart I am until I lost everything, Scott. And uh, in 2009 is when I filed the big bankruptcy for a variety of stupid mistakes. Uh, but I had to start over again after having done that. So I don't know if I answered your question, but but I, I had some successes and typically that was by get, by being smart enough to say I'm not smart enough and asking for help and uh, getting some of that strategic help from somebody who was really freaking excellent at creating the results that I wanted. Not just good at creating them themselves, but good at creating, at helping other people create those results. That was my magic formula. And then I'm not going to tell you, I didn't really let you know what I did so stupid the first, the second, or to burn those businesses to the ground, but I did it. I'm good at, I can tear something down, Scott, if you need help with that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's not, uh, let's not tear things down. Let's just build them up. I'm interested about the books that you, that you've written along with your wife and your daughter. Uh, and am I correct in saying that basically in one year you wrote seven books and they all became number one bestsellers? So there's a little, it's, it's close, but then again, I'll, 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 I'll dial it in. So I failed to publish my book for 20 years. So uh, I, when I was 20, I thought I should write a book. When I was 25, I started working on a book. When I was 30, I started working on a different book. When I was 35, I started, and, 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 and um, I know you got me started as an entrepreneur in today's episode on, when I was five, but it took me a while to figure this stuff out. And apparently I just couldn't write a book on my own. So I, followed my own advice and I finally hired a mentor after 20 years of failure. I finally decided maybe I should just have someone help me with this. And, but I, I had decided in that time that if I was going to write a book, I wanted it to make a difference to my marketing and I wanted to make, have it make a difference to my monetization. And I wanted to help a lot of people with this book, but I also wanted it to, to, that was my mission, like to help more people. And a lot of entrepreneurs, I think, that's why we want to be entrepreneurs is we like helping people. We see problems. We want to solve it. We, we were good at helping people maybe for free when we begin sometimes. And then, and then we're like, well, gosh, maybe I should start charging money for this. And, and it sometimes can feel awkward to do that. Um, I had to give myself permission a long time ago, which was a journey to like receive money from people sometimes, which is crazy. Why we have to do that? I don't know, but I did. And, um, and when I, when I wrote that first book, my, I, it inspired my wife to write her book. She's very competitive. So when I first told her about writing books and I hired a mentor for it, she's pissed off, of course, because I just spent money again on something that she's like, you know, come on, Trev, I've seen you like not follow through before you jackass. She didn't exactly say it like that. It might have even been harsher, <laughs> but she didn't. She wasn't that impressed because she because I told her um, I hired a mentor who's going to help me write number one best selling a, a number one best selling book, an international number one bestseller that I was going to turn into my most powerful marketing tool. I was going to make a lot of money, and it was going to become this vehicle to help me meet my mission. And honey, not only will I do it, you're going to write a best-selling book. My daughter can write a best-selling book and all of our clients can have books. And she, Scott, this stimulated a big fight. And I said things like, it was on a Saturday in a shopping, uh, we, we're supposed to be, we're at Target Shopping Center. We're in the car about to get out and I got pissed because she wasn't supporting me in my vision. Because to her, I was saying, honey, we're going to build a hotel on the moon. She's like, I've been trying to write a book for the last umpteen years, honey. Trevor, I know you've been trying to do it for years. You are freaking crazy. We just got in an argument. And uh, this is the one time in my life, Scott, that I can I can say, tell my wife, I told you so. <laughs> I have very few of these. Congratulations. But, uh, that is very rare. That doesn't happen it, very often. So it makes no, sure you I mean, up on the and wall. I, and I should not. I only say that on this podcast. I actually wouldn't tell her, I told you so, just for the women out there who just like rolled over and said, I'll kill him. You don't know. I... I don't actually say that. I just get, keep it in the, my back pocket. But uh, Scott, the first year I wrote my book, my wife wrote her book as well. 
And we were able to attract more clients and grow more business and had more people want to buy all of our stuff and work with us. And it did become our most powerful marketing tool. And for your audience of people who want to make more money, what I found, and people have hired me for a long time now, Scott, to help them grow their business and make money as a consultant. That's what I now do for the last 15 years. And uh, the book helped us add a zero, the first book, to the back of our income. So if everybody listening right now, I want you to think about the most money you've ever made and now put a zero on the back of it and tell me whether you like that number. And if you don't understand what that number is, say it out loud, like at least to yourself or write it down and look at it because it looks cool. Like literally, I'm pulling out a piece of paper. Those of you listening, I'm going to write a number down, whatever it is. Let's say I'm going to write down $10,000, right? And now I'm going to put a zero behind it. That's like $100,000. And if it's $100,000 and you put a zero behind it, that's a million dollars. And if it's $1 million, you put a zero behind it, that's $10 million. Like, holy monkey, Scott, I was excited. I and guess I was, that would be pretty exciting. I was excited because people trusted me more. And it wasn't because I it was, I, my book was all about how cool I am and about every story that's happened to me since I was five years old. And it was because it was the book was not written about me. And it had me in it, but my mentor helped me and actually called baloney on my first three book ideas, not because he judged me, but because he asked me phenomenal questions to have helped me realize book idea number one is a great book idea, but not the right book. Book idea number two, great idea, but not the right book. Book idea number three, like we just continued until I found ha ha. And I wrote my first book, Scott, in 24 hours. Wow. That's uh, pretty impressive. So what I have found is if you, and, and so anyway, Scott, when I realized that this was such a cool tool and I learned how to use it, I wanted to give that back because that's what I've always done. I became a scuba instructor because I like scuba diving and I wanted to help people with it. I like flying in the air. So I became a, a, a parasail captain. I like uh, doing well in business. So I started helping coach and consult business owners to grow their businesses. And then when I wrote my book and then it worked for me, it's like, if it works for me, it can work for you. So it worked for my wife. It worked for my daughter. My daughter wrote her first book when she was seven years old and became a number one best selling author on her eighth birthday. And today she's 11 years old. She has 10 number one best selling books. She's working on two new ones. We started a little publishing company where we help kids publish their books. And two weekends ago, she and I taught a little workshop to kids about how to publish their books. My daughter made almost a thousand dollars on a Saturday afternoon by helping kids publish their books and then offering their kids their parents a way to go ahead and put them into her program and help support them. So uh, what I, I, I try to practice what I preach and I try not to preach what I don't know. This is stuff that I know. I know how to turn books. I know how to help turn storytelling into phenomenal marketing tools that generate fantastic leads that have people say, I can't wait to spend money with you so that you, so that you, ex they exchange money for this amazing gift of awesomeness, whatever that awesomeness is that you're selling and then they say, I can't wait to give you more money so that I, so that they get what they want. The problem solved, results delivered. And now I have a publishing company for business owners and people that want to leave their legacy and tell their story. And for kids, we have this publishing company and a scholarship program to help kids publish their books and help parents help their kids tell stories in a book form and become more confident like this program that we're doing with kids now. And then we capture their imagination forever in a book. And um, in answer to the question of how many books have I published in a given year, uh, at one stage, I published 10 books in six months for myself, my daughter, my, my wife. And it, no, it was in, in, yeah, in, in three months we published, in three months we published 10 books because I'm now a publisher and I wanted to prove that you could. So I've published books a lot of different ways. Some of these are kids' books. Some of them were books about writing books. Another one is my wife's book, which is about uh, her best book. Oh, my God, this is one of the coolest marketing books she, she has in her arsenal as far as what works for her. And uh, now, Scott, I have 11 number one best-selling books. Um, I actually don't really advise that people write more than one book at a time. I did those others so I could prove it could be done. It wasn't the smartest decision financially, and it was very difficult to do. Uh, one book at a time is all someone needs. All too often, I think we 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 open up too many cans of of whoop ass, 
and we're like, hey, I'm going to do all these three, four things. And in this case, I did 10. Like I was insane, Scott. It was just this is a mistake. But <laughs> I did it. And, I, and it's good because I now publish books and I can say I did it. But I'm not telling your audience to do that. Like one book, make it phenomenal, turn it into your most powerful marketing tool. And the way you do that is by getting help. Find someone like me, someone who's done it before, who's helped others do it. And now, now you got some. That's an awesome story. I want to segue, because I know we don't have a lot of time, into branding. So to begin with, like, what, do you, what is branding to you? And also, uh, how do you use it to, to grow your business? Branding. Okay. Branding. Branding, I think, is everything. Um, I, I met a hypnotist, a world-famous hypnotist. And right now, at the top of my head, I can't remember him. Really famous. Uh, and really rich <laughs> and he hired Richard Branson and asked him a question about about this uh, about growing his business and this new new venture he wanted to get into and he hired Richard Branson like in a kind of a cool and dangerous way that you and I probably never would he hired the whole island he he Richard Branson owns an island in the Caribbean and 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 he just reserved the whole damn island. Like it was an expensive, I don't know if it was a hundred grand or what it was, but he spent a week with Richard Branson and his friends and family, and they went out and just did it. Like this guy's playing at a, at a, at a high level. And the one thing Richard told him that it's like everything about this new vision that you want to create is around branding. And it is the bread and butter, it is the breath, it is the it is the foundation, it is, it is your business, it is what people think and feel and believe about you when you're not in the room. And so branding is everything. And one of the reasons why I like to help people with books is that it establishes a foundation of a brand and phenomenal marketing. When when people go through my program and I help them write the right book, remember I told you, Scott, that I did not have the right book idea at the beginning. Uh, I needed help to figure that out. As genius as I am, my first three ideas were poo-pooed and they weren't the right one. So I like books because they're the foundation of a brand. They establish instant credibility, authority, positioning, um, and they build trust and desire. Like oftentimes we share our vulnerabilities and fears and failures in a book that builds trust. And oftentimes we all look in the mirror and we're scared to share our skeletons in the closet. We're like, Shh, don't tell anybody that I'm having a hard time with this. Don't tell anybody about my bankruptcy. Don't tell anybody that I feel fat in the mirror. Don't tell anybody that I used to lie, cheat or steal, whatever it is. I don't want anybody to know about that. That's why they call it skeletons in the damn closet. But what I have found, and most of my authors will take the advice and use is that Part of your brand is how you connect with your audience. And it's not just about how great you are, right? Like Superman's pretty great. You know, he's got like a lightning that shoots out of his eyes and these bullets bounce off of his chest. All that's cool, but it's not a cool story. Like when, when even when, is it, is it Marvel Comics? Who, who owns uh, Superman brand? Is it Marvel? D DC. DC. So when DC was doing, like they needed to, Marvel did a better job with vulnerability on all of their superheroes than like when Superman first came out, he had no challenges. The, 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 the cartoon man, he was just Mr. Man and Mr. Awesome. And it's a boring story. He's like, look, he, he's freaking cool all the time. It wasn't until, um, until Marvel came in and started kicking butt with with the developing the character that they created Clark Kent with the glasses and the geekiness and the awkwardness and all of that so that he had even kryptonite didn't even exist as far as his limitations when the when the cartoon first came, came out or the comic first came out so oftentimes we as entrepreneurs or business people or our brand we're fearful of sharing what we're not good at so a brand is as much of what you're great at and the problems you solve and the bullets bouncing off of your chest What's just as important is your weaknesses and failures and things you're not good at. Um, you know digital marketing, and you probably have heard of the company called Digital Marketer and uh, DigitalMarketer.com, and they're uh, it's a company run by Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher and Roland um, at uh, Roland. I uh, can't remember his last name right now. Uh, anyway, there's like three four guys that run that company now. And we were talking about branding and avatars and how important it is to have clarity around your North Star as a brand, unlike who you 
what what's your superhero avatar on your North Star is what you're best at, right? Like the Wolverine can't die, and and uh, and and Forrest Gump is is like really fast, right? But Forrest Gump had a problem, right? He couldn't take a picture with that, like, <laughs> he was kind of an idiot savant. He was like kind of slow, but it's every, but he was Bubba Gump shrimp, right? Like he was just dumb enough to like be the only ship out in the ocean that didn't get sunk by the hurricane. So what's important, the North Star is what you're great at. But then the South part the, the, is the, what you're not good at, what you won't stand for, what you actually is your problem. And, and, and the, the, what you won't stand for. And there's other parts of the compass that we could get into. But a brand is the foundation of feeling and emotion and trust and conviction for what you do and what you stand for. And all too often, people are scared to draw the line in the sand. Because we remember the bully, right, in school, right, it sucked. Right. I don't I wasn't I don't know if you can recognize this. For those of you listening, you probably think I'm like I'm like the, I'm as big as the rock or bigger because my voice is so masculine and, I'm, and, I, and I speak with so much conviction. You're like, oh, my God, this guy must be a freaking shit brick house. Like he is huge. You know, but I'm actually not You're that chiseled. big. I can tell him right now you've got chiseled physique. Yes. Just massively chiseled. Don't imagine me as like the Pillsbury Doughboy because that is not the picture. But I'm I'm like a small dude, right? Like I'm like five nine when I hold my breath and stand on my tippy toes. So like, but but what we what was my point on this? I just got confused about my own rockness. Vulnerability. Um, vulnerability. So you, it's what's powerful here in your brand is that you share what you're great at and what you're not great at, and we're we're scared sometimes to draw a line in the sand and say. This is who I serve. This is who I do not serve. My wife went from $500 in her coaching business. For those of your audience that want to become coaches or consultants or, or professionals or speakers or something like that, I want to share with you a quick story about this because when it comes to your brand, I will give everybody a formula today called Audio Logo, which you probably all heard one, like an elevator pitch, something like that. But I'm going to give you something powerful. My wife was repositioning what she does. And wanting to get into uh, as, as a financial advisor is what she had been. And she wanted to become a coach and consultant specifically for women. And it was a real challenge for her. And she was feeling scared and not confident. And in her first year of, of her business, she made $500. Woohoo! $500. Like she could almost buy a sandwich with that. It was really good. And she made $500 in her first year. But what she learned in that first year was to draw a line in the sand and say, I don't work with everyone, but to establish her brand and say, hold on, I am, I am a recovering financial advisor. I want to work, work with financial advisors who are women. And it was scary for her to say that, Scott, because that's the that was a brand. Like she was like, I work with everyone, and she made five hundred dollars. The next year, she said, I work with financial women, female financial advisors. She made one hundred and fifty thousand dollars the next twelve months. As she delved in and got even more clarity and got really good at this audio logo, I'll give everybody the formula for if you like. She made five hundred thousand dollars the next year. So within two years, she went from five hundred. To five hundred thousand by getting that's clear that, on her brand. Three, that's three that's works. three zeros, right? If I've got that right on your your uh, equation where you said earlier about put one zero behind, she actually put three zeros behind. Yeah, my wife's kind of cool. She beat be, beat me. She did better with that one. So yeah, so yeah, three zeros. So five hundred with three zeros in two years. Okay, so what is the audio logo? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm what gonna, is an audio logo? Okay. So I did I mention before that I'm a guy and uh, I don't like yeah. to ask for directions and yeah yeah you did you're a guy you don't ask for directions and when you get something from IKEA you put it all together and you leave the piece of paper telling you what to do on the side and then you wonder why you have three or four or five hundred extra pieces laying around when you're done why did they do that square. God, why do they do that for us? And I don't know why Ikea would put something out that's not square. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, but right. anyway, my wife did, gave me, uh, taught me on audio what an audio logo was. Uh, and you can probably imagine from my attitude and my, 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 my telling you that I don't oftentimes listen to direction. I didn't want to take it. It sounded too simple. So I'm going to share this with everybody that it took me two years to even understand what it was. And my wife keep talking, talk, told me about it. And if I tell you guys this right now and you don't, 
you don't take it seriously, I'm going to give you, it's going to sound so simple. You're going to call baloney on me and you're not going to use it and it's going to suck. So here's what I would advise is that I made a gigantic mistake by not taking my wife's advice two years ahead of uh, when I should have. And, and just, it's so simple, but it's so powerful. Um, it is what you can say to someone about who you work with. And it is a brand establishing thing. It, when someone asks you when you're at a networking event, what you do, this is what you say. And it is a little formula I'll give you. It's got three simple parts. And my last little part about this is I would, instead of treating this like free advice, which unfortunately is what you're getting, everybody take out your credit card or your virtual credit card or imagine that you're spending money on this and drop, ten, drop give me $2,000 right now. I want you to pretend that you're spending two grand for this advice. If, you had a, if I had a credit card here, I'd pull it out and pretend like I'm swiping it. I do, I do, I do. So pull out your credit card and like I want you to, if you got two, if you had to pay two grand for what I'm about to tell you, don't look at my number and use that. If, if, uh, if you had to pay two grand, you'd pay attention. You'd go ahead and say, oh, 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 this is some good stuff. Because Scott, the problem with podcasts and the problem with all of our free content is people typically value it based on what they paid for it. And when they pay nothing, what's it typically, what's our unconscious mind say it's worth? Nothing. Nothing. Yep. But please don't do that to yourself or you're wasting your freaking time and you should hang up and not even listen to the rest of this. But I'll give it to you. It's just, it sounds so simple. If I don't give it a little pregame, you're going to just, you're ah, oh, it's cute. Screw you. It is not cute. This is badass. And it is a three-part formula that you will answer a little bit today and for the rest of your life, this will serve you massively in your business and your brand. Is that a good enough buildup, Scott? That is. We're all waiting. We've all swiped our credit cards. Two grand is going into your virtual imaginary bank account as we speak from millions and millions of people around the world. Millions of people? Why? Oh my gosh, my emotional bank account is so, is so filled. I'm going to fill you guys up right now. Okay, so here it is. I'll give you the formula and then I'll share it with you. Actually, let me give you my wife's audio logo a bit of that because it'll, it'll help. So typically my wife works with uh, female financial advisors, successful female financial advisors who have the problem of generating consistent leads, um, doing some marketing, uh, charging what they're worth. And then she helps them uh, go from invisibility to in demand. She helps them create results. She also, she, helps, she, she stops clients from chasing clients into them coming to them and then giving them permission to work with them. We're, I love what you just said about from invisibility to in demand. That's, that's beautiful. That pretty good, beautiful. right? Yeah. She's doing a keynote talk here real soon, and that's her phrase is invisible to in demand. And I think she borrowed that from a branding expert. Yeah, one of her girlfriends. So check this out. I just gave you the formula. Scott, let me ask you a question. Who does my wife work with? Uh, she works with uh, female financial advisors who, who have uh, the problem of what? Of not enough leads and not enough something else. I forgot. I got so excited. That's okay. Not enough leads and who, um, who are feeling like they're chasing clients. Chasing clients, right. And going from, they feel like they're invisible and they have to go knock on doors all the time. And then what's the result that she helps them create? This is when you started getting real excited, so you might not have remembered it, but what is the result she helps them with? Uh, off the top of my head, I'd say makes lots of money. But I So what's the opposite of invisible? In demand. In demand. And instead of chasing clients, they... They are attracted to her. They come to they come to them, and so I'll give you an example. My wife has a client who uh, my wife brought to one of her events, and she helped her create a video with some with information like this, and the woman made six million dollars. Nice with with one video that my wife helped her create. My wife, I, I can read you. Hold on a second. I'm just going to brag about my wife because I'm getting brownie points from all the ladies who thought I was just this male-dominated jackass. Hold on a second. I'm just going to I'm going to talk about my daughter <laughs> and my wife here. So check this out. My wife helped Lisa. This is my wife's book, Make More Money, Help More People. Scott, how did this turn into me promoting my wife? How did this happen? I don't even know. This is crazy. It's, it's called love, Trevor. It's, it's called love. You know what? I helped her write this book. So I'm, I'm actually telling you how cool I am because I helped her figure this out. So um, my, my, she went from Lisa went from minus $300 a month to making $40,000 in six months. How Brie went from $4,500 a month 
to 20, I can't, I need glasses, $23,000 a month. How Allison increased her fee from $200 to $1,000 an hour. How Denise made $6 million from a one minute video and many more. So let me give you the formula. So everybody can use this for your business. I don't care if you're a painter, if you if you sell money, if you sell marshmallows, if you like the Mississippi. I don't know what it is. My daughter, uh, my daughter's first book was written about Ninja Kitties. So we are making money behind the Ninja Kitty brand, if you can believe it. So there are a lot of things you can. Basically, this formula will work for you. The formula is typically I work with blank who have the problem of blank. And I help them create blank result. Typically I work with who have the problem of blank result. Typically I work with who have the problem of, I give them blank result. I'll repeat it one more time. Typically I work with blank who have the problem of blank and I help them create blank. Those are slightly different ways of saying it, but that's a pretty simple formula. So check it out. Scott, typically my wife works with female financial advisors. I can't tell you how many clients my wife has brought me that are men. Uh -huh. Typically she works with men. So when you're drawing the line in the sand, Scott, it's scary. It's like, but, but how about all those other women, finance, women that I can help and men? And I'm they come too, man. When you have the balls, or my wife doesn't have balls, but when you have the boobs or whatever, to like say... I work with this group. You know, J.K. Rowling wrote a book for kids. Yeah, and just, we all love it, don't we? We all love it. They built a Disney ride for her, and I just spent – she makes more money selling butter beer at Disneyland because I know I bought like 17 of them while I was just there like a couple of weeks ago with my daughter because I thought they were delicious drinking butterscotch soda for a milkshake or whatever it is. She, I don't know that she actually makes that. She hasn't given me her tax reports, but but you get the gist is there's a business behind it, but she wrote a book for kids and it had a broader appeal. Yes. But you got to draw the line in the sand and draw the line in the sand and give, give yourself some wiggle room. Typically, I work with blank. See, because when people, when you go to a networking event, what do most people do? Hi, I am a doctor. I am a, I am a plumber. I am a financial advisor. I, and, and here's my business card. Bull loney man. Nobody gives a flying fart. And who do you work with? I can help everybody. You just told them I can help nobody. What the freaking monkey, Scott? We all do this. I do it. You do it. I'm sure you do it. Who do you help? Um, people, nice people. You know, I talk to people about their book. Like, who are you writing your book for? Which is one of the core questions you got to be clear about with your book and your business and your brand. And they're like, it's for everyone. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, please. You know, my daughter's 11. Is she going to like your book? Yes. You're an accountant. Do you read, are, and you're writing but a book she, about accounting. She needs that book because she's going to be making so much money from her book. She's going to have to know, you know, to put it in a bank or something. And I can teach and her. And that's right? what they tell me. She needs it too. And I'm like, really? And yeah, I'm like, my father-in-law is in his 70s. Does he need your book? And they're like, well, okay, hold on. I kind of get your point here. So pick, draw a line. Like my my wife's book, and for those of you listening on podcasts, I'm holding up a book that's pur purple and orange. Right? And it's got a picture of a pretty girl on the front of it. And in the front of it, it says, make more money, help more people. Like this is a book built for chicks. And at the top, you know it because it says, a female entrepreneur's guide to attract ideal clients, close more sales, and increase your revenue. Typically, I work with blank who have the problem of blank. I'd mentioned chasing leads, not having consistent clients, not being clear in your marketing, not getting paid what you're worth. My wife interviewed her core audience and found out the biggest problems they're having. A lot of female financial advisors live in a world of a male dominated industry with male dominated training that say, this is the way that they should do it. And they feel at their core, they shouldn't be doing it that way. My wife has found the language that attracts them. And when she says that have the problem of blank, they go like, blah, 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 like their mouths fall open and they're like, where have you been all my life? And then she doesn't leave it there. She says, these are the results that I deliver. I help you attract ideal clients, close more sales and increase your revenue. That's the result. Pro Typically I work with who have the problem of, and here's the result. And brother, that's an audio logo. That's awesome. You've, uh, you have shared some very uh, invaluable gold nuggets. I was going to say some very gold nuggets. So <laughs> <laughs> They're very gold nuggets. Very gold nuggets. And uh, 
we're running out of time. I would really like you to take a couple minutes, tell everybody about I, the Epic Author Academy, if you want, or some of the ways that you help. You've already shown a lot of the ways that you help people who want to expand their brand, attract people versus knocking on doors. I hate knocking on doors. Um, so I want to give you a few minutes to kind of let people know how to get a hold of you. And I also want to ask you if I can invite you back sometime in the future, because I also want to talk a little bit more about positioning and branding and get into it some more depth, because I know we just cut, you know, touched the surface, but also uh, your philosophy with high ticket uh, items and products and services, because I think that's something else that people need to kind of get their head around. And more of it is because of their belief that they can't charge a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars for something when that's not true but uh, we, we run out of time i don't want to impose on you for that so uh back to you okay so i will give your audience two gifts right now so that you can get in touch with me and first of all if you can spell my name or even get close to it you'll probably be able to find me so if you go to trevorcrane.com trevorcrane.com and i'm sure that's on the podcast here somewhere and whatnot yep. so you can it, find that you can get on the video and it'll also be in the description so you guys can get access to me there and all my books and um, my programs. And I, do, I create a lot of free content. I also have a daily podcast that I do now called uh, Greatness Quest. And I, I give so much content and, and, and help people with this all the time that I'd love to help you in some way. So now that's just in general. But a specific gift is uh, I started the publishing company because, like I mentioned, it just was so helpful for business, branding, marketing. It's more about mission. See, Scott, most people decide they're going to write a book and they get inspired like I did when I was 20 years old or 30 years old. And I thought I'm going to write a book. And so I and I and I and I start writing every day. Holy moly. And I, or I get up in the morning and I write and I make a discipline that I'm going to write. But Scott, that's not how you should do it. Honestly, I, I will typically if you're all if you feel the calling of the Lord and you need to go write, great. Get up in the morning and write. But if you're thinking about a dream house, Scott, a house that you want to live in, like the house that you're in right now, like somebody had to build a blueprint for that house. You didn't just, they didn't just get all fired up willy nilly and go to Home Depot and buy wood and then go into their backyard and start nailing shit together. That wasn't that, that, that you might build a birdhouse that way. That's a very nice birdhouse. You might be able to draw co on a cocktail napkin at the table. You're like, I'm going to design a dog house. And you can do that and go down to Home Depot. But ain't nothing you build in your backyard is going in your dream house, if you know what I mean. And I know my, my dad's a horseshoer, and he built all kinds of stuff. And there ain't nothing he ever built on welding or woodwork or anything that his wife will let him keep in the house. <laughs> you know, but, but too often times we start writing, and we're creative. And don't get confused, writers and creators. I love you, and you're an artist, and I think you should create amazing things. But that's not marketing. That's not monetization. That's not the way you build a dream house. You start with a plan. You get a plan first and then you go or specific. And that's what the mistake I was making. Now, most people think they need to write a great book, Scott, and then they need to do some marketing for that great book. Once their book is done, they're like, Scott, now I need to do some marketing. I'll tell everybody how amazing it is and I'll figure it out. And then you start marketing this thing. And then some people like it and some people don't. I just put my finger to my nose and I put like went neener, neener. Like now some people don't like your book. And, and then that, that, that can be crushing. It's a, it's a kick in the nuts, Scott. Not, not, not in the gut. It's in the nuts. And girls, you have nuts too. <laughs> you know, it feels yucky, man. You put marketing out there. You put all your energy into creating this book that took you a week, a month, a year, a decade. And then somebody tells you it sucks. That's the marketing part. And you're like, yeah. And so you finally figure the marketing part out. And you're like, you know what, Scott? If I could just make some money with this. And I have hundreds of people come to me that are starving authors. You've heard of starving artists, Scott. I know you're in a house right now with all these sculptures all around you. Most, off, most artists struggle to make money and most authors do too. Yeah, and that's so true. Then the last thing is that they think, well, if I write a book, do some marketing, make some money, then it'll help me meet my mission. And I, and that's just backwards, brother. So what we do with Epic Author Publishing is I help you get clear about your mission, then a monetization strategy, which is a good value add, ladies and gentlemen, exchanging money for changing someone's life and helping them is good shit. Like you and I are going to eat a sandwich today or tomorrow or next week and like a sandwich costs money and we're like happy to give 
money for sandwiches and money for you to, and for plane flights. And we're happy to do that. But sometimes as entrepreneurs, we're like, ah, I don't care about the money. I just want to help people. So we're cool with that. I get your mission first, money second, marketing third, then we make your book. So I flip it upside down. And so at Epic Author Publishing, you can go to epicauthor.com and I'll give you a free training. Just go there and I've got a phenomenal webinar. Blow your mind. It'll help you go from blank page to bestseller in 90 days or less. If you want to work with me, you can book an appointment to work with me and I can help you or someone on my team can help you and I can point you in the right direction. But that's my gift to your audience, brother, because we will. I would love to meet with you again, but that's just it'll help you shift your mind on it. So a lot of people think, Scott, I hear you and I'm now going to do I'm not going to listen. I'm going to be like Trevor, that stubborn guy who doesn't take advice and I'm going to start writing my book. OK, and it's going to feel really good. You're going to go not take my advice and you're going to tell your friends. You might even call your mom. I'm writing a book. OK, and then it's going to feel really good. But so does masturbation. It feels really good. And I think you guys should do more of it. That's amazing. And it feels good, but it doesn't make babies. So don't get confused because when I was 20 and 30 and 35 up until I was 40, I would masturbate. Because I, I mean, write my book. I, I, don't imagine me masturbating because I've never done that. You'd go blind and get hairy palms. That sucks. I would never do that. Don't do that. But I would think I was working on my book when I wasn't, when I was just doing something that felt good and I was creating something that I didn't know how to sell. I didn't know how to market and I didn't know how to help really make a mission. I had a woman call me the other day. She's written five books, hasn't published one of them. And she chose not to work with me for like a pittance. I gave her like an opportunity to work with me for almost nothing. And she's like, no, I just think I need to go write another book. And I was like, oh, Jesus, love of all that is holy. Like, thank God. Thank God I don't have to work with this woman because I don't want her to go write another book. She's never going to publish and share with anybody and change anybody's life. So please do not follow me. Do not work with me. Do not get on a phone call with me. Do not go book get in my books. I'm going to give everybody a free book today as well. But don't, don't, don't call me. If you are not willing to do some marketing, make some money, meet a mission and help some people because I only want to work with people and you should, and cause I will ride your ass like Zorro to help you make that happen. But I am not going to blow smoke up your skirt and tell you how great it is for you to go sing in the shower. I like singing in the shower. No one can hear me. Great. Great. Go write your book alone, Hemingway in the woods for six months and never make a difference in anybody's life. So at Epic Author Publishing, we have you do it a little different. <laughs> and then, Scott, I'll give your audience one of two gifts. You got to pick it. Oh, hold on. Three. Okay, hold on. I got, I got a book about how to make big money with your book without selling a single copy. And I've got a book about how to write the right book fast. Which of those would you like me to give your audience? And I'll give you a link so you can give them away. Big money with your book without selling your book. That's that's the one I like. Okay, big money. So go to trevorcrane.com forward slash big money. trevorcrane.com forward slash big money. I will send you the book for free. Now, you will have to pay shipping. So for those of you who are like, oh, that bastard, he made me give him $7 to send that book anywhere in the world. And it cost me like 20 bucks to send it overseas, you bastards. So if you're yes, overseas... I'm you're looking here. forward to that, Trevor, because I'm in Colombia and I'm going to get you to send it here. Don't do it, you bastard. So yeah, it'll cost me 20 bucks to send you a book. Like, you know what, guys? If you don't want to pay my seven bucks, then send me an email and I'll shoot you the ebook and you can suck it. Like, I, I don't care. Like, I, I, I'm trying to give it to you. But this book is not a story about how cool Trevor is. I interviewed five people you've probably never heard of who are making big money with their book, changing the world without selling a single copy of the book because they're turning it into their most powerful marketing tool and it's inspiring and you can find some things that you can make big money with your message. And I, I think that's a really good book to choose. And uh, Scott, it's been a pleasure being with you today and thank you for letting me be a little crazy and going a little long. Trevor, thank you very much for joining us. I've really enjoyed what you shared. I totally am 100% uh, in agreement with your with pretty much everything that you said. So many times people are doing things backwards. And uh, I coined a term, because really, I'm the same way. I hate knocking on doors. Do you want to buy my widget? Do you want to buy my widget? Do you want to buy my widget? No, 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 no. That is the hard, hard, hard way to build your business and to make a sale. 
And so what I call it is reverse marketing, where you create this amazing whatever it is that everyone wants to be a part of, and then they just get attracted. And your uh, audio logo is such an important part of that whole, uh, that whole concept and that whole way of being. And I'll tell you, it's a lot nicer than uh, wearing out your shoes, walking up and down the street, banging on doors, trying to find the uh, perfect customer or client that's nowhere near where you are. So thank you very much for sharing that wisdom. www.trevorcrane.com is his website. In the descriptions will be all the links that he's talked about. And if you've got any questions, let me know and, and certainly contact Trevor and uh, get working with him. And I'm going to invite you back, Trevor, because I think uh, we've just scratched the surface of things that we can talk about. And I'd love to have you on again if you are in agreement. Already done, brother. And let me ask you a quick question about reverse marketing. Do you know uh, what a mullet is? A mullet? Like a hair, the hairdo, the mullet. Have you heard of the yeah, mullet? at the back. Yeah, so that's like, did you ever hear? So I think it was Joe Dirt. They did a movie with like uh, David Spade. And he, was, and he was like, business in front party in the back right oh uh, yes okay because that was the party that was the long hair in the back and then feathered i had this hairstyle for a decade so screw you everybody who thinks that's not cool it's totally totally cool <laughs> but you said reverse marketing a friend of mine uh came up with the term in regards to business growth and marketing and it's called the reverse mullet because oftentimes because the mullet was business in front party in the back right that was dead spade <laughs> i don't know i don't know what what accent he had but the reverse mullet is is party in front business in the back so what i did today potentially was give you something cool like you said like what's that fun thing what's that thing that people might want and oftentimes we're in a world where when you're traveling the world brother in colombia when you are doing cool stuff i just went to the bahamas and we went swimming with pigs and dolphins and all that like I, and i my baby i have a new baby who's five months old like i will promote a lot of the fun cool stuff on the front end of my business and my brand to show you who i am and what i believe in and what i stand for and then the business is in the back because that's a kind of a so in, I thought you might like it from the reverse marketing the reverse mullet came in and maybe it's like that I love that that's great thank you for joining us everybody really appreciate you we're gonna see you next time you've been watching or listening to Internet Marketing Unleashed I'm Scott Patton the Dean of Blog Economics and Pedology have a good one we'll see you soon bye bye Thank you.